I'm joined by Lord Robert May. Uh, Lord Robert May has had a distinguished career that's um, spanned continents and also research disciplines. Um, he was a professor at the University of Sydney as well as Princeton. He's the former chief scientific advisor to the United Kingdom government and has also been president of the Royal Society. Uh, Bob, welcome. So I read somewhere that you like to tackle a problem where essentially there's at the beginning no competition mm. and you like to get in quickly to an mm. area as opposed to going to an area where there's more competition. In some ways, uh, my answer, when people ask me about my career, I'm tempted to say I have a short attention span. That's why I keep hopping around. But okay. the, the truth of the matter is I like early stages of problems when they're not too crowded and... Uh, and there are interesting problems that have never attracted as much attention as I think they should. But when I do get into something new, as you just said, it has been my habit not to read too much about it, just to get, read a little bit and get a grasp of what is the problem, and then think about how I would go about understanding it better. In other words, I what I do when I get into it is I try and learn about the what questions, but I don't spend too much effort on what are the tentative why questions, mm -hmm. which are by and large lacking in the sort of things when you get in early. Um, and the reason I do that is I think if you read too much about what the current state of uh, progress is on both the what and the why, mm -hmm. uh, it will tend to channel your thinking. And it's much better if you want to come to it from first principles and ask, well, that's, that's what we can see there, but why is it like that? It's probably a good idea not to read up on what other people have said on that until you've got to the point where you've had such ideas as you think might be useful. And then, if you've got any sense, you will then turn around and carefully and thoughtfully and respectfully read all the things that other people have suggested about the why. Okay. And there are quite a lot of other interesting people um, in the world who like pursuing new questions, mm -hmm. but there are quite a few of them, and there are some particular areas that I will not name, where what the people do is they go in without biasing their approach by reading too much about what's already been done, mm -hmm. And then they have some nice ideas, which may be new ideas, and sometimes are new, important ideas, and sometimes aren't. And then they publish papers in which they cite the earlier theoretical work, mm -hmm. but they clearly have never read it. Right. <laughs> and my particular grievance is against someone who shall rem a group of people who shall remain nameless, um, who work on infectious diseases, and have done some really interesting stuff. And they always cite the things that Roy and I have done mm -hmm. and other people. But they clearly never have read them. <laughs> uh, yeah. And they, they are not in the habit of citing them. As, and when they've actually rediscovered something that was already well known, they don't go out of their yeah. way to point out or, or cite the literature behind that. Which actually brings me to a question. Because uh, there's this statistic out there that 80 to 90 percent of scientists who have ever been alive are actually alive today. So we kind of live in a very different environment where there's a lot of pressure on younger scientists. And Absolutely. I just wanted to, you know, is it really more difficult today to be a scientist? I think so. I think probably so. I think it'd be surprising if it wasn't. I don't, my reply is purely a conjectural one because I'm not as familiar with the facts of younger careers as I might be. But I think in many ways, it is just one aspect of a much wider problem. It's not just that there are more people wanting jobs in science, but partly, but not entirely, it's there are more people. Mm -hmm. There are more young people than there ever have been. Mm -hmm. And so I'd, it'd be interesting whether the increase in numbers of people wanting to go into science is simply proportional to the extra number of new young people. I think it's a bit more than that, mm -hmm. but it is largely driven by the fact that there are more people. And that's part of a much larger question. To my mind, in some sense, this is a, I'm going off-piste here, but 
one of the most interesting questions in the life sciences is the following. It was prompted by a talk that my uh, great friend um, Martin Rees, my successor as president of the Royal Society, uh, gave a few years ago at a dinner we were both at, in which he pointed out we're learning more and more about other planets out there mm -hmm. in the galaxy, about other planets that seem to have conditions suitable to life. And it prompted, uh, he made his speech and then I, and it prompted me to rather change the remarks I was going to make to say, fascinating question this then poses. It's going to be hard to see how we can answer it, but it raises the question on these other planets, as intelligent life emerges, is it going to be as stupid as we were, that it just continues on a trajectory that's clearly catastrophic, of having more and more people consuming more and more resources? Or is the more similar trajectory on Dr. Spock from Star Trek's planet where they're supremely rational, uh, are the other, is it more common that the evolutionary history of other planets is they behave more rationally and when they see they're headed towards catastrophe, then they act sensibly about local things like climate change and more general things about how many people can the planet indefinitely support. Mm -hmm. We show no sign of that. Are we an oddity uh, that's uh, going to be seen by the other people when they're sophisticated enough to visit, as it were, uh, to be a, a sad anomaly, or are we typical? I guess that's not a testable question, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's a very interesting point. And then uh, you're still very actively engaged in research, and yes. um, I just wondered if there are any exciting new areas that you're thinking about for the future. Well, uh, even while I was... Um, <coughs> the chief scientific advisor and uh, subsequently president of the Royal Society, I actually maintained a quite respectable publication rate because it's just something I enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. I really have all my life enjoyed, when I was little, I enjoyed uh, puzzles. I liked mathematical puzzle, puzzles and mm -hmm. other such things. I, liked, I nearly went off the rails playing contract bridge. My, my last partner and I went on to play for Australia for 10 years, which completely wrecked his career. Uh, but I always saw that as a fascinating game. I, I like puzzles and games, which in some sense is what all this is about. And I would like to think I will be able to continue doing that. And that the, there's not too much sense of, uh, yet of uh, diminishing ability to do so. And I, there's still lots of things in the work that I'm doing now with people at the Bank of England and mm. so on, on uh, what might be called, in fact, the first big paper I published on this w was published with the Director of Systemic Risk at the Bank of England, mm -hmm. very, very good and able person, uh, called whose surname is Haldane, and the first question I asked him was, are you a relation <laughs> to JBS Haldane? Mm -hmm. And characteristically he said, I have looked long and hard to establish that I am, and I haven't yet succeeded, but I continue <laughs> to live in hope. Okay. And we published a paper in, which had the cover illustration of Nature, which was uh, Lehman Brothers with a big zigzag down it. Okay. And it was called Stability and Complexity in Banking Ecosystems. Mm -hmm. And there's still a lot of interesting work to be done there. Okay. And who knows what other accidents will happen in the future. So this year we've had a membership expansion, and um, Ember has... Uh, embraced communities of ecology, neuroscience, and also evolution. And um, I just wanted to get your thoughts on this expansion and uh, what future directions this may take the organization in. I wouldn't be so bold as to venture looking into the far future, but it seems to me certainly a good idea. And molecular biology is doing great things, but from my perspective, it does tend to be a little focused just on accumulating experimental evidence, which is hugely important. Right. But if one is to... It, I, I have always thought when it finally begins to mature, it's going to go a bit wider and it's going to ask larger questions beyond what is there 
and uh, do experiments to see what is there and then understand what that does. You want to go somehow right back to how did it get to be like that? Why did it get to be like that? Um, what are the new windows that that kind of more focused knowledge asks? Uh, so I think it can only be for the good of everybody that, the, as it were, the knowledge base and the inquiry base, in the interest simply of pure molecular biology, broaden out to ask questions about evolution, ask questions about the ecological environment in which sort of separate things happen. Mm -hmm.